Test, test, test. Test, test. Okay, guys, can you hear me? It's 9.30. Hello. Okay, that's working. Okay, so I have to wear the microphone in order for the lecture capture to work in here. So I'm going to complain about the feedback. So if, you know, I go somewhere and it makes bad noise, I'll try to stop that. Um, but I do have to have it loud enough so that it can pick it up. So the lecture capture is the video and audio recording of the class. Um, really irritating, uh, which did not happen on Tuesday because I didn't send in the thing early enough, but today will be the first one that gets lecture captured, and so I will put a link into the Moodle site under this week with, it'll be labeled lecture capture and 124, 13. So you'll be able to go back, click on that, and you have the option of downloading it as a podcast if you just want to listen to it on an iPod, you know, like when you're running and exercising, because it'll be so riveting, like it'll totally energize you. Or uh, get it just as a video with the slides that you see and the audio. Or the best case scenario ever, where you get the audio, what's coming through the screen, and me in my own little screen. Okay, so you'll have all of those options once you click that link and get into the system. Okay, so you can mess around in there. Should you not come to class because we have lecture capture? No. You will miss all the fun if you're not here. Okay, and if you're not here, you won't get the points for the in-class quiz stuff, right? So if you are deathly ill, right, and you're throwing up, don't come, please. Lose your two points for that day. And then just watch the lecture capture to get the content and any clues I might give out. Okay? So, it's really irritating. Okay. Is that better? Microphone still working? Hello. Okay, maybe that'll be better. Okay, so when it's top hat time, which is the in class quizzes, I'll say, ooh, it's top hat time. And something like that will come up, and I will open the program. And if all goes well, I'll remember how to use it, and you guys will learn how to use it too. So before we open it, I'm going to do a quick little review from Tuesday, since the question is going to be about stuff we talked about on Tuesday. Right? And remember, we talked about the scientific process, and that it's just a way of answering questions so that you can be as certain as possible that the answer you get actually is to that specific question or the change you made and not some random BS that might be happening. Right? We said we wanted to do a controlled experiment. A controlled experiment is something where you have a control group where you do nothing to or they get a placebo, right? which is that they don't know whether they're getting the experiment done to them or not. And then the experimental group, like the vitamin C was the example, so they're getting the vitamin C, but they might not even know that, right? So if this room were split in half, half of you get vitamin C, half of you get a sugar pill, we'd have the computer give out numbers and then all these things would be labeled and nobody would know whether they're taking sugar or vitamin C so that you guys can't bias the, your results, right? So you don't know if you're actually the experimental group or the control group. I don't know who's who. And at the very end, after we get all the information back in, we feed it into the computer, and then it spits out who was control, who was experimental, and who was sick more often or not. Okay. Before we do any of these experiments, remember we make an observation or things you just know, things you've thought about, anecdotal evidence, right? I've heard or my grandma told me, and then you come up with a hypothesis, right? And our hypothesis scientifically is a statement. It's not the question. It addresses the question, and it addresses the purpose of the experiment, but it's a statement of what you think is going to happen. 
a prediction. An educated guess, like they love to call it in high school and grade school. Okay? So, whatever you think based on, if I spill my coffee on the ground, I will fall asleep during class. Right? That's your hypothesis. And then you do the experiment. Yes, I could not stay awake during class because I spilled my coffee. I've supported my hypothesis. Right? If you do stay awake because I'm so riveting, you couldn't possibly fall asleep, then you've refuted your hypothesis. It doesn't matter if I spill my coffee or not. I can stay awake. Okay? Has to be something you can prove is not true. Right? Do the test. Did I stay awake or not? Okay. And testable, right? It can't be some magical thing we can't actually test. Okay. <clears throat> so let's just do an experiment and see if this works. What do you think? So I'm going to click that, and then magic's going to happen. Okay. But the problem with the screen... <sighs> I had this problem before, and I solved it. What do you think I did? <laughs> so the screen, uh, let's see, let's make it, hmm, let's try our displays. So when we go through the projectors, the computers default to a specific display, which stretches stuff so you can't see the whole screen. So let's see if, um, hmm, 15 seconds. Hmm. All right, I did something else last time. What do you think it was? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I like what you've done here. Yes. Uh oh. When are all these things open? Mm -hmm. What the hell's going on? Oh my god. Okay. All right, so here's the one we want. But we have to be able to see the whole thing. And I did something last time. What do you think it was? I think I hit magnify. Oh, that doesn't help us. Demagnify. Oh my God, people, what is going on here? Okay, bear with me. It's an experiment. All right, let's demagnify. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Okay, so while I'm trying to figure this out, the questions will come up here. The number right here is the one that if you're texting in, that would be the number that the text goes to. Okay? And if you're online, I think you get to just push some button or something. Um, so I have not enabled this. So I can do this one because it's small enough we can actually see it. So if I hit enable Submission, something's supposed to do something. It's supposed to help us out here. Hmm, hmm, fascinating. This is not what... So where, oh, there it is, it's down there. Okay, well, but shouldn't it give us a... Hmm. Hmm, hmm. So it should... Give us a number to text in and the answer. I'm confused. Hmm. Is it showing up up there? So this is the phone number, at least last time I used it, then it gave you like, you know, 4321A is what you actually texted to that number. So they know what question it is, right? Because if we do three questions today and you're just sending A and then B, like there was supposed to be some call tag for each question. But I don't know what, I don't know. Hmm. I'm sorry? Yeah, it's taking submissions. I'm assuming these are people that are going smartphone instead of texting, because I don't know how to... Is it up here? No. 
Hmm. Yeah, I don't get it. It's supposed to give us some sort of... Hmm. Hmm. I haven't enabled what? The submissions? All right, well, let me disable and re-enable. All right, so this is supposed to be our button that tells us that. Okay, not enabled. Now I say go. Huh. So there's something in my settings that I did wrong? Yeah, it's supposed to give us a text... I don't get it. I'm going to look over here. Because the number that you text to is supposed to stay the same all semester, and then the little codes are supposed to change per question. Oh, this one's open too? No, these are all, the rest of them are supposed to be closed. I mean, I, well, all right, let me make those go away. I did it like this last semester, but maybe they changed something. I'll make the other ones go away. See, look, here's my test bank. Ooh, it's fascinating. See, it's still not giving us anything. Oh, crap in a hat. All right, let's try again. <laughs> All right, I'm going to have to call those yahoos, find out what the hell I'm doing wrong. Okay, so anyways, let's pretend... Yeah, sorry. Yeah, because they didn't give us one. It's supposed to pop up right in that little, right, either right down here, or it's supposed to show up right at the bottom of the screen. And it, it's not, it's, it's not doing it. Okay, texters, we'll do this question again whenever we figure out how this works so nobody loses points. But I will go through what normally would happen. So normally everybody would text or send their submissions. And then I would disable it, which sometimes actually doesn't really disable it. And then I can uh, show the right answer, right? So it's a statement. You could test it. It's falsifiable, right? Why do birds fly south is a question. So anything that's a question cannot be a hypothesis. It's a good question. A hypothesis would be birds fly south because they get cold in the north or because there's better sex in the south or whatever. Okay, something you could test. And then Stonehenge was built by magic. You can't test that. It's a statement. It might be your educated guess, but we can't test it so it's not a scientific hypothesis. Okay, and so then I can go back up here and I can show the report. And I can say, yay, almost everybody got the right answer. Okay, so sometimes everybody gets the wrong answer and then it's obvious that I did a really crappy job of explaining that, whatever it was. And so then I can go back over it. Okay, and then you guys get free points and I figure out when I suck and when I'm okay and everybody's happy. But, yeah, the, that little code was supposed to come up for the textures. I will make it happen. Not right now, but at some point. Before Tuesday. Okay. Does everybody feel good about this? Except for that little glitch. Okay. Everybody's happy? Everybody's excited? 
Okay, so the last stuff from this first lecture that we didn't finish on Tuesday was about, so how do scientists report their information? How do we get the information out to the public? So what happens is that anytime we do a study, we have to publish it in what they call the primary literature. So the primary literature are journals that um, publish science stuff. Yeah, let's see. No, no. Oh, I always turn it off back there. There we go. Now you guys in the front can start snoozing. Yes, yes. Okay. And primary literature is peer-reviewed. What does that mean? Peer review means, for example, I have a bunch of students and they're slaving away in the lab doing experiments, right? And they make their graphs and they do their statistics and they write up their results. And then we have to send this to a journal to get it published. And what the journal does is they send it to three or four other scientists, other professors, in the field to analyze, critically review, which really means rip it apart and tell us how bad it is and all the things we need to fix, okay? So that if I set up a really crappy experiment that was not well controlled, I got people out of student, you know, coming out of student health that just, you know, went in for the bubonic plague to do my experiment instead of a random sampling, right? Those scientists write up a, <laughs> a review of what we've done and tell us all the things we need to fix before we're allowed to publish it. And so then those four, three or four people send their information back. I don't know who they are, it's all anonymous. And then first you weep openly for a while because you've already done all this work and they told you it totally sucked. And then you might have to repeat experiments, do new experiments. Sometimes they just want you to rewrite stuff that wasn't clear. I don't know what the hell you're talking about, please clarify. Right? Or these, w the studies you referred to, you interpreted that data incorrectly, please try again, whatever. So you go through all of that, you fix everything they said, then you send it back to the journal, the editor sends it back to those four people, and they have to agree that it's now good enough to be published. If they don't agree, you're out. That's done. So now you have to either just go do more experiments, try something else, and try to another journal, or that stuff is just, you just can't publish it, okay? So stuff that gets out into a scientific journal, scientists can trust, for the most part, that it's as accurate as it can be with the technology at hand, right? They did their best job at getting controls, doing the right experiments, understanding what's already out there, so that it's, we can say this isn't total bullshit. Now, total bullshit gets through sometimes, but for the most part, scientific evidence in a peer-reviewed journal is something we'd trust, okay? What we wouldn't trust was looking at somebody's website and some BS they might put up there. I have a website, I could put whatever I want up there, right? I'm a professor at a university, I could make all kinds of claims that are total crap on my website if I wanted to. There's nobody, there's nobody policing that. Right? I could say I've cured cancer and I found this gene and whatever. But it could be, I mean, most people don't do that, but there's crazies out there, right? So what shows up on websites is not, tr it's not trustworthy unless it's referenced by one of these articles. Like I might say, you know, recent discoveries in our lab have been blah, 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 and then I cite which journals they were published in. So you could go find that journal and make sure I'm not lying about it, right? So you can trust that information. Now there are some websites that are, that are relatively trustworthy because they reference stuff like the Center for Disease Control. If you look that up online, they're gonna give their statistics about how many people have got influenza this year, what strains, you know, all the STD uh, stuff, all the cancer risk, all of that. Most of those will have references throughout. You can feel comfortable that that's you know, a good website. The American Cancer Society, that sort of thing. But random people's websites could be total crap, okay? So that's why when we do, when we write up our literature, we can't cite somebody else's website as evidence for you know, why our experiment is good. We have to go to the primary literature.
Okay, because that's trustworthy. And then what gets out in the media is a whole other story. Okay, usually based on fact, but many times misinterpreted. Okay, so many, many times misinterpreted. They're science writers or they're, you know, they're scientific uh, reference people. Not, you, they can't know everything in every field. Right, so somebody publishes something and it says, you know, the last part of it, this may help, um, you know, this new therapy may help AIDS patients, blah, blah, blah. Some media could grab that and just turn that into, you know, AIDS patients take this drug and everybody's going to be cured. Right, the media loves to sensationalize stuff. If it's boring and just scientific knowledge, they're not, it's not going to come out. Okay, so there's lots of stuff out there that's total BS, right? And so using the literature is a way to figure out what's true and what's not. Okay, so for you guys, I don't expect you to go to the journals that do this primary stuff to analyze every single thing in the media, but I would like you to take things from the media with a grain of salt and know that if it's something that might specifically affect you or your family, there are places to go to look for the actual information, right? You can always ask me to help you find stuff, okay? Or, you know, or other people in the field. And not to just take, you know, the, the, the viral emails, don't freeze water in a bottle because you're gonna die of plastic poisoning. I got that email from friends and they're, oh my God, I've been doing that all summer for my kid and now we have to go to the emergency room. <laughs> oh my God, people, right? That's just bullshit. There's, plastic does not degrade in the freezer, okay? If you microwave the crap out of plastic, out of Tupperware, and it starts to melt, yeah, that's a bad idea, right? If you got styrofoam and you throw it in the microwave to reheat your sandwich, and the styrofoam gets bubbly, <laughs> you probably shouldn't eat that, okay? But, right, if you boil plastic, some of that plastic, the polycarbonate, polypropyl carbonate, whatever the hell it's made out of, will leach a little bit into that water, and then you dump out the boiling water, and then you rinse it, and it's now fine again, okay? So, things that run around that are sound a little crazy, right? Don't go throw out every piece of Tupperware because you're poisoning yourself, okay? Right, you can, hmm. And most of them will say, Johns Hopkins, blah, blah, blah. If you just go to Johns Hopkins, you'll see on their main site, this is a disclaimer that viral email going around is not us. We do not employ anybody by the name of Dr. So-and-so, you know. So you can always check that kind of stuff, okay? The secondary literature is a little better for uh, students, even students in the field of science, because these are what we call a review, where somebody like me, like if my, uh, we work on uh, leukemias and lymphomas, and look at what genes are up and down, depending on how aggressive a cancer is, trying to figure out why some are really aggressive and kill people really quickly, and why some you could live with for 20 years, even though they seem to be the same type of cell, right, so we try to look at that. Um, so I might go into the primary literature and read thousands of papers and then compile it into one review of that field, right? So all the information that everybody's found out about a specific gene I'm interested, I could write that up. And so then if you care about that gene, you just go to that one paper, right, instead of having to read thousands. So that's really helpful for everybody in the field. And the same way, it's also peer-reviewed. It has to go out to experts. They say, oh, you misinterpreted this, blah, blah, blah. You suck at writing. You need whatever. Your grammar blows, whatever. Um, and so again, all of this stuff passes through more than one person. right? If you kind of write an article in the LA Times, like I could send in an article, I could pretty much say whatever I want. Right? So, Stuff in journals is trustworthy. Everything else is a little bit suspect, right? But you can always find out whether whatever the announcement in the media is true or not by going back to this crap. And of course, I'm talking ahead of myself. So here's the info about peer review. Remember, whenever I do this, because that's what I do, I just start yammering on and on. All the slides will be posted to the Moodle site, so you can always go Download them if you want to. Just open them and look at them to take notes. So if you miss stuff as I'm talking.
talking, um, it'll always be up there. Okay. <clears throat> and then we talked a little bit about this before epidemiology. That was the one where we can't do an experiment because usually it's something dangerous like smoking, like we anecdotally. Smoking's bad for you. Well, epidemiologically, it's bad for you also. So again, that's where you take university records and people who have lung cancer or heart disease or all this other stuff, and you find a correlation between, you know, we looked at 100,000 people that had heart attacks at all these different hospitals, and 90% of them smoked, right? Or, what, or whatever you're looking at. 50% of them, you know, drank three pots of coffee a day or whatever, okay? And then you can do some statistics to see how, how likely it is that it's by chance that they were smokers and had heart attacks, and what are the likelihood that, that it, it's actually linked, right? And so then they can come up with this correlation between smoking and lung cancer, right? And your statistics sort of tell you how much you can believe it or not, or eating fiber and lower risk of colon cancer. And then you can do animal studies to try to sort of um, corroborate or back up the human studies, right? Mice are not people, as it turns out, but they are mammals, right? They got fur and boobies. They give birth to live young, just like us. As it turns out, if you look at the DNA, we're, we're, pretty, cl we're pretty close to the rat, as it you know. So we can use animal studies to, like, they have lungs just like ours. They have all the organs just like ours. So you can have mice living in an environment with secondhand smoke. I don't know if you can actually get them to smoke a cigarette, but you could probably make sure they get secondhand smoke, right? And however long they live, a mouse lifespan is probably two or three years. So that would be like us when we're 70 or 80. So you could do a, a lifelong experiment on an animal in only one or two years, right? So that's a doable thing. And then they look to see how many of them have heart attacks or strokes or lung cancer or other cancers. And then, again, they're not people. Doesn't mean the same thing would happen in people if we did that experiment, but we can't do that experiment. But then we can correlate that with what they find out from all these university studies and make the claim that smoking, smokers are at much higher risk for getting lung cancer, heart attack, stroke, all kinds of crazy stuff. Question? Isn't that um, harmful for the rats? Yeah, the question is, isn't that harmful for the rats? Yeah, you're giving them cancer. <laughs> or you might be, right? That's the correlation. Right? So animal research is there to help human beings. Right? Some animal research is there to help animals. Right? If, how do you think vaccines for dogs, your dog, right? Who doesn't love their dog or their cat? Right? They had to have been experimented on some experimental animals. Right? Experimental animal protocols in the United States require you to uh, eliminate as much pain as possible, keep them in clean uh, conditions, be as fair and just to an animal right, as you would be to a person, except they're not people, right, and so we do, we are allowed to do experimentation, as long as you go through this process of, you have to write proposals to the government or whoever your funding source is and the universities, right, you have to have the proper animal facilities to make sure they take care of them, and you're required to euthanize if any animals are in undue pain, even if that means it wrecks your experiment, right, so if animals start getting tumors much younger, you wanted to wait two years to see what happens, and within six months they have tumors, you're required to euthanize them. That's not fair to let them be pain and suffering for your experiment. Right? But does it follow up on that? It checks on you? Yeah, and they definitely follow up on you. So all the universities, oh, the paperwork and the process of being able to use animals is amazingly difficult. Yeah, and so they actually have uh, individuals at the university that work in the animal facilities that are not scientists, they are there to watch to make sure and they'll tell you, you know, cage two, need, you have to, you can't continue this experiment or so forth like that to make sure that we can be as ethically um, nice, right? You, just because they're animals doesn't mean they need to, they should suffer, 
right, for the benefit of us. But we do use them because of the amazing results we can get to help ease human suffering by doing animal research. Okay? Yeah? So for like um, human diseases, do we have like human volunteers that actually volunteer to volunteer? That's a great question. So for human diseases, do we have human volunteers to do that kind of stuff? Well, we used to volunteer people that were in prison to do experiments. Not acceptable anymore, right? Other countries do things that we have no control over, right? But most places that are developed countries don't. And so, yeah, so anytime they do any kind of human study, even if it's a survey, so like the vitamin C test, Right? I, if I was really going to do that experiment, I would have to write up a protocol and then list all the possible risk factors that the person might encounter doing this experiment. Right? Which for that would be uh, an allergic reaction to something in, there's a possibility of that. Um, there's a possibility that being in an experiment will be stressful to you because you're worried about whatever and that you may need counseling. So we need to have some way, you know, an, an 800 number or some facility for anybody in the study to go to. So we would have had to set up with student health to have a place for if you're in my experiment and you're feeling stressed about it or anything that you can go there to reduce that stress. You know, you're allowed to quit the experiment any time, blah, so all this stuff and then you sign at the bottom and I sign at the bottom and then all that has to go to a human subjects review board to make sure I'm not, you know, injecting you with radiation and not telling you, you know, something like that. So yeah, there are protocols you have to go to to use humans in any kind, even if it's just a stupid survey, right? So lots of them, if it's a survey monkey, right, there will be the first page, I, you know, these are the possible risks for taking the survey. You might get stressed because you have to answer multiple choice and if you have test anxiety, you know, this is just so that everybody is clear and that they've agreed to those risks, even if they're essentially none, right? You're going to take a survey to ask you about what you ate today. Well, if that stresses you out because you ate a bunch of donuts, you're like, God damn it. <laughs> now I have to talk about those donuts I just ate again. So they do that to make sure that that doesn't happen, so that, if, so that you can always decline doing it based on what is coming out of that. Yeah, that's a great question. Okay. What else? Oh. Uh, so this is just what I was talking about, a correlation. It just makes a pattern, right? It, it's not causal. It doesn't, you can't say smoking causes lung cancer, right? Unless you did that exact experiment. And then that's still not proven, even if it's in the mouse experiment. You blew the smoke into the mice's cages or whatever, and 90% of them got lung cancer, 60% or whatever. It could still have been something else, right? It's within the realm of possibility that it wasn't the smoke. It probably was. As close as you can say, yeah, the control group, you know, lived in the same environment, same kind of cage, same food, same water, same everything, but we didn't blow smoke at them, right? We blew air through there, so they got the same turbulence of wind or whatever, but you still can't prove it. But that would be more, much more causal than just looking at university records and, oh, look, all these people that had heart attacks or had lung cancer, lots of them marked that they were smokers in their surveys. Right? Because it's not causal. It's just a correlation. And so then lots of correlations together with lots and lots of individuals in the experiments makes it more, much more supported. Right? Over time, yes. Smoking is a gigantic risk for lung cancer. Doesn't mean if you smoke, you'll get lung cancer. And doesn't mean if you don't smoke, you won't get lung cancer. But you're at much higher risk if you do, by the numbers. Oh my god, what else? <laughs> Whatever. Okay, and then we already talked about this. This is just from the book. So if you don't know what the hell I'm talking about, <laughs> read the book, people! Okay, uh, so just about the peer review. And so chapter one goes through pretty much all the stuff I talked about. Any terms that I didn't talk about in the chapter, you're not responsible for. Okay, so lots of the chapters are going to have extra stuff that we don't have time to go over. If it's not up in my notes, you're not responsible for it. If it's an example of the things we talked about, then yeah, you know, that 
then you should probably be aware of it. Okay. Hmm? Hmm? I don't know what I did to it. Okay. No. Oh, the hell's going on? Oh, I was testing, so okay. Oh yay! I totally forgot. Okay. We're gonna watch a little show. Okay, so we're gonna talk about a little game we're gonna try to play. Some semesters we play it a lot, and other semesters I have a bunch of duds. Are you guys duds or are you fun? Fun. fun. All right. I know it's 9:30. It's hard to be fun at 9:30, but that's why we drink a lot of coffee. Okay, so let's watch this. If I can make it go. Where's my little thing? Okay, so we're going to play that game. <laughs> Today, I guess our secret word is going to be fun. Yay! Okay. Other days, it'll be some word that's in the, you know, whatever. Like spam. That's always a good one. Um, <laughs> so I'll try to make it something I'm not going to say too often, because otherwise people get exhausted with all that screaming. Okay, but I will either post it in Moodle, what the secret word is, and if I forget, then we'll talk about it at the beginning. If, if you guys want to go through what's in the lecture and come up with a good secret word and tell me at the beginning, I can make that the secret word. Okay, and then you have to remember to do it. Okay, so we're in. Yes? Game time? Yes? Okay. All right, so we're going to start whatever chapter this is. Chapter... I don't remember. Not chapter two. It's 14. Oh, you guys are the best thing ever. Um, thank you for helping me. <laughs> Most of the stuff will come from whatever chapter I say it is. Occasionally I move a few things around from the text because it's easier for me to teach it in that order. And I feel like it helps you guys understand it better. So it'll all come from the lectures that I've posted to the next exam. Right? So if, oh, I shouldn't say if. I should say when you are reading the text and you say, what the hell? She, you know, this wasn't in this chapter. It's in one of the ones. You can use the index, look up artificial selection, and oh, it's in this chapter. She threw it here because this helps people understand the entire process of evolution. Okay. What is artificial selective or selective breeding? So, you know, when, remember, I don't know, if you've read literature about the 1800s, maybe in England when the gentleman, right, you had to have a bunch of money, and if you were a gentleman, you weren't allowed to have a job. You, you got a trust fund from your parents, and if they had lots of money, you had lots of money, and that was great, and if they were not so much money, then you were just kind of poor all the time. But you weren't allowed to get a job because you were a gentleman. Right, And then the ladies just like they did nothing. They sat around and did needlepoint or some bullshit all day. <laughs> right? So they're bored. They don't have freaking jobs. Like what do they do all day? Well, let's collect pigeons and let's have them have sex and see if we can make crazy different feathers and colors to pigeons. And then let's get together with all our other gentlemen losers <laughs> and compare pigeons. And then we'll give each other prizes. Who has the best pigeon? 
right? That was their life, okay? So here's our standard pigeon or rock dove, right? It's really a dove. If you look out on campus, there's a billion of these, right? They're all kind of scraggly. <laughs> they eat Cheetos, whatever. <laughs> you know, <laughs> picking up our scraps. But if you look, they all have some variation. So when you leave class, today's not a great day because it's raining, but whenever, you'll, you'll see they're not all blue. He they have, some are all gray, some are more brown, some have all different colors. They actually have some nice plumage if you look at them, right? Uh, you know, we all just kind of think they're just kind of ratty because, you know. But they're not, well, some of them are gross. So, <laughs> so what they do is they collect a whole bunch of pigeons, stick them in their cage, and then they choose ones that they want to mate together. So if they wanted to get more gray offspring, right, they like the gray ones, they would pick ones that have the most gray plumage, right, and get a male and a female and mate those together. They have babies, right, pick the gray ones from there, mate those together, sometimes with their siblings, mm. yeah. or with their parents, ooh. As it turns out, birds don't care. <laughs> So they do that until they get an all gray bird. Sometimes they have more feathers down here and they, oh, let's make one with lots more feathers. So the offspring that have the most feathery feet are bred with the offspring that have the most feathery feet and so on and so on and so on. And in 10 to 20 generations, you can turn that into this. Right? <laughs> it happens. They do it. Right? Or that. The hell? <laughs> right? And look at that poor guy. <laughs> That's just wrong. So there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different pigeons out there that all came from just the scraggly old guys on campus. You guys could do it too. Any of us could do it. Right? You could do it with mice. You get a whole bunch of mice, go to the pet store, and they're all different colors. You want to just have black ones. You find the ones with the most black, and you breed and breed and breed and breed, and now all of yours are black, right? Or bigger, or smaller, or things change over time, okay? The traits you end up with, the DNA you have, is what you pass to your offspring, right? So if you have DNA for feathery feet, you're going to pass that to your offspring, Right. Two feathery feeded guys are going to make, in a lot of cases, more feathery feeded in the offspring, and so on and so on. Right? It doesn't happen in one generation. It might take 20, might take 100 different matings to get something super crazy, but you can see change relatively quickly. Okay? That's called artificial selection or selective breeding. Right? Human beings have been doing that on this planet since the time of the Egyptians, since we domesticated animals. There is not one domestic, agriculturally relevant animal or plant that has not been selectively bred to what it is today. Okay? None of the wild rice that you buy is not wild rice. It's just another version they call wild rice. But it's not. It's not the wild relative that it started from. Right? People aren't stupid. <laughs> I mean, we, we have this big brain for a reason. Right? Having a giant brain and a big head is not good for reproduction. As it turns out, some damage is done on the way out. Right? right? We're gestated in there, and then we've got to come out a very small hole. Okay? So our brain is as big as it can be and still allow us to pass through the birth canal. So we use that big brain, right? If you're a farmer and you, right, you plant your crops and you harvest, you're going to save some of the best seeds, some of the biggest, plumpest, whatever, seeds from the best tomato to plant next year. You're not going to take the seeds from the shitty tomatoes, right? You want to eat the good ones too, but each one's got a bunch of seeds in it. So you save the best ones and plant that next year. And then that year, they save the best ones. And over time, the tomatoes get bigger and juicier. And then you realize, ooh, if I, maybe if I actually have these two in this field, and so on and so on and so on. Right? Corn, sweet corn, was just looked more like that baby corn stuff you get in Chinese food. 
Right? And over time, ooh, let's save the ones that are the biggest to plant next year. And the biggest to plant. And over thousands of years, we have corn that we eat. Okay? So all of them have been selectively bred. Change over time, modification with descent. Right? doesn't happen in one generation, but it definitely happens. Another good example is a common wild plant called the wild mustard. And that has been domesticated and selectively bred and artificially selected to become all of these yummy vegetables I know you guys love. Okay? So if you take the wild mustard and you want to make broccoli, you choose the ones with the biggest flowers, right? The bro broccoli heads are actually flowers that are not open yet. And you breed those together, crossbreed, breed, crossbreed. It's... It's pretty easy to have animals have sex. It's even easier with plants, right? Because pollen is sperm, and you just have to take that and, and then dab it onto the flowers, right? The flowers of a plant is essentially their genitalia. Mm. So next time you're sniffing a rose, <laughs> putting your face right in their genitals. How oh, rude. And they're, almost all of them are both male and female. So they can, uh, they can do themselves better than that. Okay, but you can, <laughs> you can cut off the boy parts, if that makes you feel uncomfortable, of a plant and then fertilize them with another one's boy parts. So that's the only, so then you know exactly which plants are doing each other and all that stuff. Okay, so all of these different vegetables and there's all kinds of examples of this. Things change over time depending on what genes are being passed. Right? Depending on what's being passed from the parent to the offspring. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if we know things can change over time, because people have made that happen, right? We can give you hundreds of ex examples of that. Why can't, why wouldn't that happen in nature too? But nobody's out there selecting it. Not like a higher power selecting it, but if something's good at surviving and reproducing in a specific environment, they'll have more babies. More of their babies will survive to reproduce, to have more babies to survive to reproduce. Because if you're not good at living in an environment out in nature, what happens to you? You're dead, right? If, you, if you're a fox and you suck at catching rabbits, you starve to death. If you're dead, you can't have sex. You're not supposed to have sex. <laughs> Someone's dead. Right? So there's nobody selecting the ones that are good at it. They just happen to survive to reproduce. Because if you stink at living out there and catching food, you're going to be dead in nature. Right? Other foxes aren't going to come over, oh, here, I'll share a rabbit with you. Right? People might do that, but wild animals generally don't. Sometimes family groups do take care of each other, but in the end, you have to be good at surviving and reproducing, or you're dead. If you're not good at reproducing, but you're great at surviving, you don't pass on your being awesome genes. Right? You're just, you carry them to the grave with you. Okay? Yeah. Are there any animals that are necrophiliacs? <laughs> That's a great question. Are there any animals that are necrophiliacs? Do we know what that is? <laughs> Vocabulary people? Okay, life lessons. That's having sex with dead things or people. Um, I don't know, but I don't think so. That's a good question. Hmm. Somebody Google that and find out. All you people with your computers out there, your smartphones. Um, okay, so this would work in out there in nature only if there's lots of competition, only if there's lots of animals around, right? Because if, if you stink at catching rabbits, but there's only one of you and there's hundreds and hundreds of rabbits around, you're probably going to catch one because you're not competing, nobody else is getting them, and there's tons of them, okay? So... This whole natural selection or, or dying when you suck at something out there and only the good ones passing on their traits, it relies on the ability of 
animals to have exponential growth or populations to expand relatively quickly. If there's lots of food available, pretty much everybody survives and reproduces. Right? There's tons of food around. You don't have to really be good at it because a rabbit just bats you in the head. Oh, there's a rabbit. I'll eat it. Right? So we know that this can happen. We know if you put in tons of food in an environment, you'll get population explosion. Right? Just like if you were in an area where they, they protect deer, where you're not allowed to hunt them anymore, and then people feed the crap out of them, right? population explosions. Because there's nothing controlling that. There's no predators around. There's no, nobody's picking them off, right? And you're feeding them outside food. They're not even relying on their environment. You get a population explosion. We know that happens. So that probably happens out in nature too if there's lots of food available. But at some point, there's so many deer that there's not enough people dumping food out for them to have them all survive. So then which ones survive if there's not enough food for everybody? The, yeah, the ones that are good at getting the food. Or the ones that are most efficient at processing what little food they have. Right? It just makes sense. When you start running out of food, whoever's best at getting it are the ones that are going to survive. Right? Now you also have to be good at reproducing. So if you're just you know, if one of those deer just stinks with the ladies and nobody wants to have sex with him, well, then all those I'm awesome at processing food and getting it die with him. Okay? Survival of the fittest. Fittest meaning best able to survive and reproduce, not like one who can run on the treadmill the longest. Right? Not fitness like we think about health fitness, but survival and reproduction. Mostly reproduction. I mean, you have to survive to actually do the reproducing, right? Because if you're dead, you can't go at it. <coughs> okay. So we know these two things are true. Right? So if there's not enough for everybody out there, then not everybody can survive to reproduce. So the guys that die, who aren't as good as everybody else, or are slower, right? I... I ate a little bit of food and I'm, I'm weaker than everybody else and so I fall off the cliff and you know those guys are fine. Okay, So you're not going to pass on your traits if you're not good at whatever your environment happens to be. Because you, you're not having sex and you're not having um, babies that then survive to reproduce. Right? If you, let's say, uh, talking about somebody's fitness Right, reproductive fitness. If you have more babies than anybody else, but they all die before reproductive age because you suck as a mom, then that's you're not fit, even though you had the most babies. Right? They have to survive to reproduce. Right? So there's always this balance in nature of you know how many babies somebody has and how many grow up to actually reproduce again to pass on those really good traits. Running faster if your prey would be really good. Or being able to you know, hide well, having really good camouflage. Um, being able to sniff out your prey if you're a predator. All of those things are going to help you survive and reproduce. If there's unlimited food available, pretty much everybody survives and reproduces and then you're not selecting for those things. Okay? And when we say selecting for nature, you're not dying. Everybody's living. And everybody's having sex. Okay? <clears throat> Is it always the same? Is everything always the same? What's good for survival and reproduction? Is that just a universal across the planet? I mean, some things have you have to be able to actually do the deed. <laughs> right? That would be a universal thing. But getting food or hiding or running fast, that's probably what might be good depends on where you are. Right? Depends on what, where you are to, in science, we'd call your environment. Right? So the, the best example that I like to use because it relates to us as a people, right? All these animals, ah, oh, whatever. The fox and the rat and whatever. Here in the United States, where we have ample food available to us, 
in forms like Cheetos and cupcakes and ding dongs and donuts and you know oh, Panda Express love Panda we are at a health disadvantage if we are really good at storing fat right if you're super efficient at processing food and you eat the same amount as somebody who's not so efficient you're gonna gain weight because we have tons of food and it's always all over us right and it's cheap and we just love it and we want to eat it so if you're really good at storing fat you're at a health disadvantage you're at risk for diabetes you're at risk for a heart attack you're at risk for stroke you're at risk for all kinds of crazy stuff right if you gain weight easily so here the survival and reproductive advantage if you want to take it that far would be somebody who's not good at storing fat right you have a really high metabolism you can eat donuts all day and not gain weight right that's what's good for us in the United States what about a developing country where food is scarce what about where you get one bowl of rice a day who's at a selective advantage there if you store fat well you're gonna survive to reproduce if you have a high metabolism you're gonna starve to death when you're a kid right two completely different environments the exact opposite is good for you depending on what environment you go into okay same would be for any kind of animals sometimes it doesn't matter you're really good at storing water because you live in the desert and then you go somewhere where there's lots of water that's not gonna kill you off but vice versa would come from some place where there's ample water and you're not good at storing it and then suddenly environmental damage whatever global warming your area turns into a desert or you know that we plow down the forest and it becomes desert there's no water available if those species are not good at storing their own water they're gonna die Right. so it's all about your environment what makes it a good thing to survive and reproduce so there's no real thing like one thing what's a really good trait for surviving and reproducing besides actually able to have sex you you know because again you can store as much water as you want if you can't have sex or nobody will have sex with you then that's not going to help you yeah so that's a great question well can't your body adapt to a new environment maybe it depends on how extreme that new environment might be and so that's a great question that leads into the next stuff uh, as environments change if everybody in the population is exactly the same you either all survive or you all die right if you have variation in the population those that happen to be born with the lucky gene of I can handle being dehydrated better than somebody else they'll survive the other people and then they'll pass on those traits and as everybody else gets weeded out that population either ends up being better at it or you go extinct right so one individual person yeah you can be a little more efficient and we adapt to environments lack of food everybody's metabolism will slow down a little bit so if you're fasting for a day like for some religious holiday or just because you ate too many donuts the day before your metabolism will slow down considerably within that one day but at some point it can't slow down to the point like a tortoise hibernating right so at some point the individual can't adapt you're either born with something or not you know and in the population it's the lucky ones that happen to get that which may have not have helped them ever before and not have been an advantage suddenly environment changes and now something that you know nobody wasn't selected for or against it just kind of occurred in a few of the population becomes extremely important oh my goodness oh my goodness all right now oh, and then our good friends right if we still didn't believe us oh look at the dogs right descended from the wolf they've traced back the the dog tree of life using DNA analysis of all the different species back to uh, the wolves and there was a couple different events of domestication from the wolf 
right? And different lines, but you know, you got your like, you know, happy-go-lucky mutts, and then, right? I mean, these aren't shaved. This doesn't grow hair. <laughs> right? And so that was some kind of mutation, right? That occurred in some individual and then persisted by breeding the one that had no hair with one with a little bit of hair and on and on and on until the entire population had that mutation. The inability to sprout hair from the follicles that were in the main part of the body. Okay? Right. So sometimes you see it's slow, slow, slow. Two with less hair get less hair and so on and so on and so on. And occasionally some sort of mutation turned off a gene during development that allowed hair to grow. Right? And then they, people, oh, that's awesome. And so they selected for that right, by breeding that with the least haired possible. And if it's a dominant mutation, then you'll pass that on to your offspring. Okay, so sometimes you, it's a gradual, 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 and then sometimes, you know, some mutation will pop out in some offspring that then, you know, you can persist with. Okay. <clears throat> so this is what we've been talking about. There has to be some variation in the population. So if it's a bunch of clones, exactly the same DNA, they either all are going to have the adaptation to survive or they're all going to die for the most part, right? If your DNA is exactly the same, there's no difference between anybody else, you're all in or you're all out. So most populations have variation. You can look around the room, there's lots of variation in this room. Even in animals that all foxes look the same. Well, if you actually looked at an entire population, you could see small differences. Same with, you know, look at the stupid pigeons out there. They all seem like they're exactly the same until you really look at them. All different colors, there's some different sizes. Some of the beak sizes are different. The, the fuzzy footed versus scaly. You know, there's lots of variation in most, most natural populations too. So who's ever the best out there at surviving and reprodu reproducing are the ones that win, are the ones that are alive to have sex and pass their traits. Okay. So I say whoever has the most kids wins. Of course, those kids have to survive to reproduce, blah, blah, blah. But if you think about it that way, because in order to have lots of kids, you have to be good at surviving, right? And this could apply to the males or the females. You have to be relatively healthy, especially for a female, to produce offspring. So you can't be on your deathbed because you stink at getting food and have a bunch of babies, okay? Males probably technically could, but if you're the scrawny, weak male in the group, none of those foxes are going to have sex with you. Okay? The, the females choose the strong ones, the ones that are out there doing whatever. They bring in them the most rabbits or building them a nest, right? Birds building, all that kind of BS that happens in mating. Okay? So that goes hand in. You have to be good at surviving in order to have a bunch of kids. Because okay, you're passing your awesome DNA to your offspring, right? Okay. <clears throat> so if this happens, and we know it does through artificial selection, because we can see it, so why wouldn't it happen in nature, right? Then the characteristics of an entire population are going to change over time. Because only the guys that survive to reproduce his traits are going to be out there, right? All the other ones are going to be dead. If there was some sort of, uh, I think a lot of books have the examples of moths in, I don't know, some British island or some crap. And they were all white because the forests were birch trees that have white bark. And then the Industrial Revolution comes around and everybody's burning coal. And man, talk about pollution way worse then than the smog we have. I mean, there's black smoke in the air. All those trees turned black. Now those white moths stood out like free pickings. Here's the buffet for all the birds. Okay. They, within that population, there were a few mutants or variations of those moths. There were a few that were light gray. There were a few that were black. Right Before the coal and all the smoke, those were the ones that got picked off. 
So if you were unlucky enough to be born the black moth, you were going to likely be eaten before you lay eggs. Some of them got through and laid eggs because the black ones persisted. Maybe 5% of the population were black moths. 95% were white or light gray. Right? Over the course of five years, there were 5% were white and 95% were black. Because now the black ones hid well, the birds didn't eat them, they were having sex and laying eggs like crazy. The white ones most were picked off every season. A few stuck around to lay eggs. So that change in environment within a very short time changed characteristics of an entire population. Right? Natural selection or this adaptation is not those white moths turned black because they knew it would be better to be black. Moths can't know that and they can't turn black. Right? Now if you're an octopus you can change color. Mm, or a chameleon. Right? But most species can't go, oh, now the environment's dark and uh, you're just toast. You're just bird food. Okay? So the adaptation had to exist in the population. If there weren't any black in that population, no mutation happened to cause that pigment change or anything, then that population would be decimated and it's likely those moths could go extinct or they'd exist at a very low frequency. You know, the bird population would go up for a while and then it would crash because they'd all starve to death too. Okay? So there had to be this variation. There had to be some black or dark gray or some that existed. Otherwise, you know, they can't just suddenly turn it on. And because they need to be black, wouldn't make a mutation happen. Right? Who make, nobody makes mutations happen. Okay? They do or they don't. It's random. It could be in their, you know, reproductive organs. It could be in their pigment, right? There's no pressure to, ooh, now we need to mutate so we can survive, right? There's no consciousness in these population. It is what it is, okay? So if a random mutation happened that causes pigment to be expressed and it's dark, that would help those individuals survive and reproduce, okay? So the definition of a population scientifically speaking, and that's what we'll talk about here, is it has to be organisms of the same species. So that one type of moth, not all the moths on that island, right? There's lots of species of moths, right? One species in a particular geographic region. Because if, let's say, there's another island with these same kinds of moths, the same species of moth, but they were upwind of all this smoke coming out of London those birch trees would not turn black. So then the white ones are at a selective advantage at that other location in a different environment. Okay, So that would be considered a different population than the ones on the black trees that got decimated by the birds. That the black. So there was a change in, in trait frequencies on the black tree population, but not the other island that didn't get all the smoke. It's the same species, different populations. Okay. <clears throat> so it's organisms of the same species occupying a particular geographic region, an area, in one area. And you can define that area, or the scientists can define it however they want. All the moths on this one, or all the species, you know, this moth on this one island is my population that I'm going to look at. Okay. As it turns out, species within a population are much more likely to have sex with each other than with another population, right? So if you're a moth on the island of the black trees, there's like, there's just chicks everywhere, right on the tree next door, maybe the branch next door. Are you going to really fly seven miles to go have sex with somebody in another population? No! Right? You're going to have sex with the girl next door. It's way more convenient. Okay. Now it's possible that a big wind and there's a tornado and blew some moths onto the other island. Yeah, then they're going to have sex. They're not going to go, oh, I can't have sex with those moths. They're in another island. Okay. If they're the same species and they bump into each other, hey, it's a party. We're going to have sex. Okay. But in general, populations, it's just convenience. They're right there. Why should I go walk five miles? I got one right next door. 
Okay, so that's the definition of population. Same species, specific area, they're having sex with each other. <coughs> okay, so this is a little example of population. So this is a little bird that lives in California, um, all up and down the coast. So its range is in orange, or yeah. So this whole area, so essentially the coastal region. But as you know, if you're at all familiar with California, the coastal region, here we are, look at us, right here. In LA, right, this area is probably all pretty similar, right? But is LA, is the climate and the temperatures and the environment here the same as up in San Francisco? No, it's freaking freezing up there. And then what about nor way northern California where they grow all the marijuana? Right? No, it's, all, it's totally different environments. Okay? And so if you're talking about these birds, we would talk about different populations. Right? And you can see how adaptations or the, the best traits for an environment would be different in this population than one maybe up there in San Francisco. Right? And even from the valley to Santa Monica, right, that's a pretty big climate change difference, especially in the summer. Right, it's like 75 and breezy, and it's 110 and we're dying, right? So those two different populations need different things to survive to reproduce, okay? So we call those pop different populations, even though they're all the same species of this bird. Because these guys are likely to have sex mostly with each other, or maybe these guys, because they might get frisky. But it's unlikely that the population way up there and this guy, unless they're migratory and they all run into each other, which these guys apparently aren't, right? Within their populations, the most sex is going to go on. A little bit with nearby guys, or, oh, I got lost, and, you know, whatever. Okay. <clears throat> oh, my God. What is this? I thought it was supposed to go. What are you people? On dope? Yeah, really. Okay, so we're not going to do top hat because I couldn't, well, you know what? No, because it didn't work. I was going to try it again, but um, I will make that texting problem go away for Tuesday, and then we'll do the one again to make sure the texters can do it, and then the ones for this lecture. There will be a quiz that opens today. Ah! It will only be over the stuff from Chapter 1. Okay, so the scientific process, peer review, blah, blah, blah. You get two attempts, so just open it. Follow directions. Rule number one. If bad things happen to you and it logs you out and you lose your mind, <clears throat> complain to your friends. <laughs> and call IT if you think it's something with the system or Moodle. It will close Monday at midnight. Hello. I'm back. Um, you want to add? Okay, so send me email this afternoon or whenever the soonest you can, and I can send out numbers. Okay. Okay. Does it matter that I'm? No. Nope. Thank you. Hi. Hi. You said to come after class for you. Yes. So so send shoot me an email and I will send you a permission number. There's there's at least ten seats available, so there's not that many people trying to add. What's your so. email? Uh, it is C Malone at csun.edu. You can also find me on the biology, you know, faculty page if okay. if you get uh, If you add, if I give you the ad code today and you add it, I will put you into Moodle. So even if they're supposed to automatically okay. put you in, but sometimes it takes like 24 to 48 hours to get you in. So I will send you a permission number and add you to Moodle, so you can do the quiz. Oh, okay. But yeah, you'll want to add like. By tomorrow, okay, okay. So we just but I'll put you in. Yeah, tomorrow. and then you have till Monday night at midnight to take the quiz. Okay. What if um, because I have to get permission numbers to all my friends that I have to add. Okay. For financial aid. Okay. Before you like before you can Tuesday or Thursday. Enroll. Yes. Um. Should I just wait till then? Yes, but shoot me an email so I can put you in Moodle so you can take the quiz. Okay, thank you. So that I know you're in the class. Hi. Hi. Um, send me email, and I'm going to send them through email. Okay. Yeah, so just shoot me some email. And, uh, yeah, you can find me on the bio page, um, but it's...